Good afternoon, Your Highnesses, Excellencies and Dignitaries, members of the ABLF Network and all of our wonderful guests here with us today. My name is Reshem Katecha. I'm a strategy and policy specialist based in the UK. And as ever, I am delighted to be here at the ABLF. I'm really excited to introduce you to an incredible woman and entrepreneur. Emirati entrepreneur Nadia Zal is the co-founder and CEO of the UAE-based Zaya Group, a boutique developer specializing in high-end real estate development and hospitality. Zal is best known for the prestigious and award-winning Zaya Nurai Island, which was founded in 2008. And if you haven't been or looked it up, you absolutely must do straight after this. It was dubbed by Newsweek magazine as the most luxurious project in the world. And what's more incredible is that it was her mission to create sustainability through this program, through the introduction of solar lighting throughout the island and transportation solely via the use of electric buggies. She was also instrumental in the successful completion and launch of Five, which is Dubai's most celebrated resort on the Palm Jumeirah. She's won a reputation in a challenging industry for being one of the region's most dynamic and progressive uh, business and financial minds. And she has won too many awards for me to tell you about now. But I'm delighted to introduce Nadia. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Wow, what an introduction. <laughs> Thank well, you. you've done it all. So, uh, <laughs> so congrats. So you've established one of the most reputed and luxurious brands in the hospitality sector. Um, how have you done that? Why don't you tell us a little bit about how it became? Um, I think, you know, obviously Dubai's been, you know, known for its real estate boom. It was um, something that runs in my family. So I come from a family of real estate developers. Um, and I think when I started to look at real estate development in Dubai, I realized that, you know, that niche boutique high end um, product didn't exist, especially in the green space. Um, so actually, before doing the I actually started um, Dubai's greenest community, lowest density community called Al Barari. And it's, you know, 80% green and 20, completely opposite to what people think of you know, in Dubai, our concrete jungle. Um, so that was really kind of my first entry into the real estate space. Um, and then it was kind of a natural evolution because Abu Dhabi was kind of the next big thing. And when I looked at Abu Dhabi, I thought, wow, you know, the sea is beautiful. The I they have natural islands, unlike Dubai. And I'm, you know, on a personal level, I'm you know, really attracted by raw nature. And so when I saw this island, I just it was love at first sight. I was like, oh my God, I have to do something here. So yeah, and here we are today, I suppose. Um, I've I've always focused on, you know, niche products. So, you know, Albrari was very green. Narai is also, like you said, um, we focus a lot on sustainability, bringing the outdoors in. Um, and then with Five also, it's very niche in that the whole experience is um, targeted to millennials because um, that's where I see the hospitality space going. So, yeah. And, and tell us a bit about that, because you you pointed out three incredibly impressive projects, but all with their very own um, specific audience and target market. So how do you design differently for millennials compared to um, your target market for your other projects? So I would say for the millennials, um, they're very, very experience led. Um, I think more and more they're less about the actual physical real estate. So, you know, they're not. So, for example, with Five Palm Jumeirah, the rooms, I mean, they're beautiful, don't get me wrong, um, but they're not for them, for millennials, they're not so concerned about having a larger space. They want the common areas, the f and you know, Instagram, I think about Instagram every time I'm looking at a design, I'm like, where are they going to, what are they going to post in the background? I mean, my designers think I'm completely crazy, but, um, you know, I think we look at design, you know, even when we're, we're creating food um, experiences or a cocktail experience, we're con continually thinking about, yeah, the, you know, without repeating myself, the experience of, you know, whether it's say, for example, we have like this really famous dessert um, where it's like a massive champagne glass and it's got a trifle in it. And, you know, visually it's really interesting to look at and it's an experience of sharing. 
not very COVID friendly at the moment, but, um, you know, so we're constantly thinking about the experiences because they, and, and we always also design spaces that can evolve and have pop-ups because they just want, you know, it's very, they want more, they're very demanding. Of course, uh, as a millennial, apologies for being so demanding, but that champagne glass has my name on it when uh, when I'm allowed to fly back over to Dubai. Um, so you were ahead of the curve. I mean, obviously, you're very forward thinking when it comes to recognizing what millennials want, but um, you were incredibly ahead of the curve back in the 2000s, designing your eye to be um, so sustainable, given um, lots of companies are only just switching on to that now. Um, how can leaders incorporate sustainability and still be successful and profitable? How can we explain to leaders? as it's not one or the other um i think definitely i would say today a lot of the um products out there you know are much more commercially viable the sustainability space you know there's been so much r d so much investment into that space so i don't think it's a question of viability anymore um you know i don't think we can use that as an excuse anymore. Um, and also I think that, you know, I found, so for example, with Narai, you know, a lot of our guests, um, when they, you know, as you're getting on the boat and you see the solar um, farm in the water, they really appreciate that. Um, you know, it gives them something to feel, especially in the luxury space. I think a lot of people have started to feel guilty about, you know, being in the luxury space or having an expensive holiday so when they feel like you know they're not contributing to to destroying the environment it it helps um a lot so it's definitely a value add um and you know personally i've seen the roi is is incredible um i would say you know we have so much information out there there's a lot of you know, for example here we've been so lucky that you know there's quite a few government departments where you can reach out to them they've done a lot of research because i you know to be honest i didn't know how to start with i knew i wanted to do a solar um farm but i didn't know if it was commercially viable you know i didn't know where to start looking um and i was really lucky to have you know colleagues working in Musta, for example in abu dhabi and they you know were amazing at pointing me in the right direction and you've made an incredible success um, for yourself working in what is typically a very male dominated industry. How did you manage that um, and what advice would you have for other entrepreneurs and other female entrepreneurs in particular? Um, I would say that it's been a, an interesting journey. I think, um, you know, at the beginning of this journey for me, I was feeling like I was having to overcompensate uh, for being a female boss or, you know, having to deal with contractors or being on site. And I feel like I almost wasn't being true to who I am. So I was trying to be more aggressive or more distant as a leader, you know, trying to put my boundaries in place and kind of, you know, almost forced it on people that I am the boss, you know. Um, and and that's i suppose from conditioning and and you know having those underlying feelings of you know being a female boss and being in the middle east which is actually it was all in my head really because people are actually really progressive um in the middle east and i think i've you know i've oscillated between you know going from being trying to be really masculine and that go getting energy and tough and having very strong boundaries to going back to my more innate nature of, you know, wanting to be motherly and supportive and close to my, my team. And it was really difficult for me because I was almost my, my team probably, <laughs> probably at times thought I was like have split personality because I was trying to find my balance. Cool. Um, and I think, you know, I finally got there where, you know, I've, I've embraced both those sides of me. And I think it's, it's been amazing now for me to trust my intuition as a female. I think we're not, we really undervalue that as female leaders because we feel like we need to, you know, do and go. And, and, and I've realized that when I've slowed down and, and, and tuned into my intuition, 
I've actually, I'm actually a better leader for it. So I would definitely say, you know, go with your gut, trust your, you know, as females, we're naturally more intuitive and there's a lot of power in that. Um, so yeah, that's my two cents anyway. <laughs> Yeah, that's really valuable. And I think, um, you know, I work with a lot of women in similar industries, male dominated industries who find the exact same um, challenge in terms of balancing what they think a leader needs to be like or look like and what works best for them. So that's really fascinating to hear. And how have you had to evolve your leadership style, um, given the unprecedented challenges brought on by the pandemic? Um, I would say, I think the most challenging thing or the most I would say not really challenging, but the most important thing for me during this time has been managing my state and my, you know, my mindset and the energy levels that I bring to work when I show up. Um, you know, as a leader, I think, you know, it's we have to show up and show up at a highest level because your team's only going to bring that step below you. Um, so for me, you know. I would, rituals have been amazing for me. So I would, you know, whether it's just savoring my coffee in the morning a little bit more or watching the sunrise or, you know, having a little dance in the car on the way to work. Um, you know, these things have been, and I've actually really encouraged my team during this time to actually also do the same. So the other day I walked into someone's office and he was actually having a dance um, in the office, but, you know, music is an amazing thing to help change your state and manage anxiety. Um, you know, we've had lots of, I've been encouraging of people to have outdoor meetings because, you know, just being outside, being close to nature. Um, I've also um, was really strict, um, I would say about eight weeks in um, to the pandemic last year about a no news policy in the office. And I just put my foot down and I said, look, I understand everyone's got anxiety about this, but while you're in the office, I don't want to hear the numbers. We're not, you know, we already all have a lot of anxiety. So this is the policy and, you know, that's that's how we're going to do things. Um, and I was really, I really was, um, I suppose, in my mail um, when it came to that. Um, so, yeah, I would say that was, my number one thing was managing my state and helping the team manage their state as well. That's really fascinating. I love that. I think we should all be doing a bit more dancing in the office. Um, but speaking of COVID and, and hopefully um, hopefully now we are allowed to talk about it, um, the real estate uh, and hospitality sectors have been really badly impacted. Um, what are your expectations about a revival for the sector? When do you think things will start to go back to, to normal, if ever? I mean, I would say it's really difficult to cut, like, you can't really say the whole, first of all, real estate, for example, in Dubai, real estate and hospitality have behaved very differently to one another. So, um, for example, the real estate sector actually has boomed as a result of COVID um, in Dubai. Um, we're seeing a 30 to 40% increase on prices um, from mm -hmm. last year. And I think that's mainly due to the fact that the government, you know, was very decisive, handled the pandemic, you know, relative to the rest of the world in an amazing way. Everyone felt super safe, you know, food security, you name it, everything was handled, you know, amazingly. And so I think all of a sudden everyone wants to move to Dubai. Um, you know, I think people that tended tend to, to look at Dubai as a developing world risk. All those things kind of just fell away because we've proved to be, you know, a proper gateway dynamic city where, you know, well, every, I, I mean, I'm seeing it. So the real estate has kind of behaved differently. Um, hospitality, of course, has suffered. But again, you have different segments within the market. I think the most hit, obviously, were the business hotels. And, you know, I think with Zoom calls and, you know, look at the space we're in at the moment. Um, I think, you know, business hotels generally across the world are going to suffer inevitably because just, you know, the dynamics have changed um, with business travel and the necessity of it. Um, so I think, you know, that needs to be looked at differently. I think leisure 
my personal feeling is that it's going to come back and come back with a vengeance. <laughs> I think people are really ready to travel. Um, I would say globally, probably 2024 for a full recovery. Dubai has been very different. We're seeing we're seeing the bounce back already, but that's just because of the way our government has handled things. But globally, I would say 2024. Good to know. Not not so long to wait. We can see the end then. And what would you say are the secrets, not just to creating a successful brand, which you've obviously done, but also to sustaining it, especially in such a challenging sector? Um, I would say, you know, the team, obviously, um, creating the right culture. Um, you know, like for example, with the with the hospitality. You know, I I come from a real estate background, so hospitality was a completely new, uncharted territory for me. So, you know, just simple things like the incentive structures of like you know one of in, the way things are typically done in in a hospitality space. When I looked at it, for me, was counterintuitive because the people that are actually creating the magic magical experiences for guests on the ground were not, in my opinion, fairly incentivized or, or rewarded. It was skewed to the top. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, we've completely flipped that on its head and we have a, a, a much more flat management structure. Um, the incentives are distributed the, the other way around. Um, you know, so I think just, yeah, I, was, I would say being more inclusive, um, creating a culture where people really want to be there and, and and you know where their voices are heard and it's it's a balance of keeping you know being inclusive and then also being decisive as a leader and you've obviously um unfortunately um given you're so young with such an impressive career you've unfortunately had to um lead your group through two different um crises in a sense with the pandemic and then obviously back in 2008 to 10 the financial crash um so you've really um really been through it all um, what did what did 2008 to 10 teach you did it equip you in any way and what lessons would you give to other leaders in terms of the two very different um challenges you've had to lead the group through i would say 2008 for me was invaluable i mean i i don't think i would be here um you know doing what i'm doing if i hadn't have had because i literally you know i left my family business and then i was hit with the financial crisis it was Throw, being thrown into the deep end, sink or swim. Um, and I'm definitely, I would say, I'm, I'm definitely a much better leader for it. Um, at the time, I was really, really stressed. But, um, you know, I think crisis teaches you, I think as entrepreneurs, we all tend to be, you know, creative and visionary and risk takers. And our natural desire is to keep doing the things that we enjoy which is you know creating great products marketing creating a vision a strategy and we we tend to ignore the things that we don't want to do like number crunching looking at legal risks you know cost you know cost cutting the costs or all, all those kind of things that are not innate to us as as entrepreneurs and i think you know i learned i learned really quick and fast that you know it it doesn't work like that. You've got to embrace all parts of the business and you have to focus. So it really showed me where my weak points are. Um, I must admit there were a lot of very expensive lessons. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it really prepared me for what was coming. I mean, with, with the pandemic, for example, within the first two weeks of, you know, of the pandemic hitting, I was already liquidating personal assets, making sure, I mean, I was lucky not to be able to have to use them, but I was liquidating those immediately, you know, because for me it was like, right, okay, I've got to make decisions fast. I've got to have the liquidity available. And, you know, as a sponsor of a business, I think in these times is when you need to show your commitment to your companies and, you know, as I say, go all in. Um, so, yeah, I think, it definitely prepared me. 
Good, that's the answer. And, and I like to think of them instead of as expensive lessons as investments, because clearly they paid off. Um, and so looking forward, I know you talked about um, potentially 2024 for global recovery, but, um, but for you specifically and for the group, what do you see as your key um, opportunities and challenges for the next three to five years? What, what's ahead? I mean, we're, again, you know, we've been in an extremely fortunate position, you know, whether it's, um, you know, the real estate sector has been booming in Dubai as a result of the pandemic, which has been unusual. Narai, because it's, again, an island getaway, we've done really well just from, you know, local staycations. Um, the five, obviously, millennials have been, well, <laughs> not so phased about COVID, really, and they've been coming and staying at the hotel and, you know, having fun, basically. So we've been really lucky in that every sector, every kind of, I'd say, business group um, has fared well. Um, and we're in a super fortunate position to be able to take advantage of the fact that there are amazing global assets out there that are available for sale. So we're in growth mode. Um, we're looking at acquisitions. I mean, we've we've done one recently, so we're opening um, five hotel in Zurich at the end of the year. Um, we're actually looking at something in the UK because that's where one of our biggest market really um, in terms of the guests. So yeah, it's um, it's a great opportunity. I don't think we're going to see these, you know, as they say, trophy assets available at these prices again. And how do you intend to, I mean, very excited from a selfish perspective, the UK project. So I look forward to hearing more on that when you're ready. Um, but what steps are you taking and what steps should other leaders be taking to future proof their projects, um, given, you know, we've now had two kind of world changing events in about 13 years. What will you be doing to protect yourself in the future? Um, I've realised that, you know, um, investing in like investing more time as a leader in mentoring my team is super important because you know when you're having to do crisis has been enough handling it on my own but also you know you you need the whole management team to be able to help guide you through these uncertainties um so i'm definitely spending a lot more time I'm doing doing less myself and actually, you know, investing in the next generation of leaders within the company. Um, you know, again, it's I think when you have leaders, generally they tend to not want to look at litigation or legals or things like that. So I'm spending a lot of time, um, you know, on that with them. Um, and I said, I suppose you just, you know. You have to be innovative and, and, and as a leader, keep looking at where the market trends are going, um, you know, have your ear to the floor, um, speak to your customers. You know, I think that's been key. I mean, for me, for example, just talking to my customers. I know it sounds really basic, but you'd be surprised of how many how many leaders are not in touch with what's actually, you know, what the feedback is from their clients. And how, how are you doing that? How do you engage and speak to them? Um, is it like a casual, you're in the lobby thing, or is there a, a more structured, formal process? We do a bit of both. Um, we do have, you know, apps where people have, you know, anonymous walls where they can write stuff and, and things like that. But it's different, you know, when you see an online comment, and of, of course we get lots of, lots of them when you're in the hospitality industry. Um, but... I think it's different when you actually are there physically talking to someone. So, yeah, I try and, uh, and take the time to meet, you know, whether it's people that have moved into their homes and my residential communities or, you know, just walking around the hotel, being in a restaurant. You know, yesterday I was in, in the lift and I just sparked up a conversation. It, you know, it's interesting just to hear what they have to say. And you, I guess, especially people often only go online to complain rather than to share their, I guess most people don't share positive thoughts online unless, they, uh, unless they're unless they compelled to. But you mentioned mentors earlier on today, and I just wanted to pick up on that. Um, do you have a mentor or mentors? What purpose do they serve to you as a leader? Um, how did you find them? Um, I would say, you know, I think there's different 
I would say, you know, I, I don't have, I, I work with a coach um, and I've, you know, I've been having, um, well, I've been having different coaches for different areas of my life for the last 15 years. I think that's been super important for me. Um, you know, even if a lot of the things they tell you, you already know, but it's having that accountability. Mm. Um, and that's, that's helped me a lot um, because I think as a leader, you tend to, focus too much in one area and, and just having that sounding board has been great. And someone that's not in your business day to day can give you perspective. Um, in terms of mentors, I would say, I, I don't have one particular person that I look up to or anything. I think, you know, different people have done things um, amazingly in different ways. And, and there's, it's so nice because there's so much information out there from successful people that you can read and learn um you know courses master class i mean it's amazing what we have access to these days maybe you could do a master class on uh, on establishing a, a great brand that would be fascinating um and i guess just uh thinking about you'd mentioned much earlier on your inspiration for new it was um when you were in abu dhabi have you found it um that you've had to look to new places for inspiration, given all the travel restrictions. What's giving you that kind of creative excitement these days in terms of your new projects or how to evolve your brand? I would say, yeah, I mean, generally, I'm someone that loves to travel and I like to travel to new places. So, yeah, it's been difficult um, for me from that perspective. Um, but I would say, you know, just, of course, we have access to the internet, we have beautiful imagery to look at, you know, you, you have that, but, and I do, you know, I spend time on Pinterest and Instagram and because I'm a very visual person. So I, I, I need that visual stimulation. Um, but really I would say, you know, obviously everyone has a lot more time on their hands, at least in the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and just, you know, slowing down, I spend a lot more time in nature, that gets my creative juices flowing. Sunrise, sunset. Oh yeah, and then, um, yes, and you're spoiled with them in Dubai, aren't you? It's, uh, it's been quite some time since I've seen a proper hot one from here in London. Um, but tell me, you you talked about, um, you know, having a great government um, and contacts to, to bounce ideas off. Um, what more can governments do, not just in uh, the UAE, but around the world to uh, support industry and support developments especially the innovative sustainable ones i mean i think there's a lot of amazing um initiatives already out there um there's a lot of um financing funding available for example for people in the green energy space or if you're in real estate development and you have a sustainable um element to it then you have access to a lot of um a different pocket let's say, of, of money that's not a typical, a conventional bank, um, because a lot of these banks have been mandated by governments to, you know, encourage this and give people access to cheaper means of funding. Um, so there's a lot happening in that space already. Um, but I think, you know, one thing we, we've done super successfully here in, in Dubai is that there's quite a lot of think tanks and conferences and um you know like for me for example one of the things that was super amazing for me to be part of was the young arab leaders organization when i was much much younger i mean just before i even you know started as an entrepreneur just being in those forums and having access to super successful people and listening to them you know it's really inspiring and i think there's not I think Dubai is really unique that way. So I think, you know, other governments have a lot to learn from that. But, you know, if the youth have more access to, I mean, like like this virtually, which is amazing, um, more think tanks and access to, to conversations like this, I think it's inspiring. 
Definitely. Well, I wish we could have longer with you, Nadia. You've been so fascinating and thank you for being so generous and sharing all your insights. Um, if you have watched this session, have any thoughts or comments, please do post on our social media wall with the hashtag ABLF City. And remember that if you missed any part of this session, you can always come right back here at the end of the day and view it on demand anytime after today. So thank you so much for joining us, Nadia. And thank you to our brilliant audience for joining us today. And remember, Remember that we are back every month featuring global leaders in powerful conversations. Thank you so much.